Well, that was a deal that was signed earlier this week. And uh, soon afterwards, I spoke to Executive Chairman of the Africa Energy Chamber, NJ Ayuk, who explained what this deal means for the two countries, and in fact, the region as well. This is a very, very significant investment for not just for Uganda or, or Tanzania, but for the region. You're going to have a pipeline that would give a pathway to export crude right into the shores of Tanzania. But what is even bigger than that is there's been a lot of discussions about this happening for a decade. And this is a decade of negotiations finally closing, but bringing two countries together to finally make a final investment decisions together with an international oil and gas company. So beyond us just having a deal, it's about looking at how, what this would mean for jobs, for employment, for local opportunities that would really build growth from, from bottom up. And I think we just have to manage it well and ensure that the hopes and aspirations of the Ugandan, Tanzanians, and others from that whole East African community should not be, be held back again by a failed promise of oil. And I think that is really critical for this. Uh, you've partly answered my next question, and it's how does it translate into benefits for local people, people and local businesses uh, along the supply chain? Local businesses and people have to start now. If you don't have an opportunity, you have to start looking for the opportunities now. I'll give you an example. If you're going to look at training or you're going to look at taking on contracts, if you don't have those technical capabilities, look out to maybe South Africa, where it is the most industrialized market in Africa, well-trained economy, they can come in with a lot of services, partner with local companies in Tanzania or Uganda to benefit from part of this $3.5 billion investment and you work in collaboration. And there's even a bigger benefit with the Africa Continental Free Trade Act, you can actually collaborate more together. For jobs, don't wait till the pipeline kicks in, start looking at the possibilities of getting engaged and finding that we shouldn't sit at home and wait for that. But also we need policy that backs it. At the chamber, we have engaged with both presidents and, and the companies as well and got guarantees that says that they are going to ensure that policies does back local content empowerment and also back inter africa trade so that Africans can inspire other Africans while working on this so we can tap into experience from maybe countries like Nigeria, countries like South Africa that have a more advanced engineering building capacities. There's gonna be a lot for, every, 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 for everyone, but also the citizens of both countries do not get bogged down by saying it's just me, tap into more developed markets and bring that in. But for, for example, my South African um, colleagues in the energy, energy space, get out there, go out there, empower others, work with them so that these dollars can stay in the region and in Africa. Talking about benefiting Africa, um, in the past, we've seen these oil companies come to our continent, they dig holes uh, and they export the raw product and then we have to re-import the refined product. Is this going to be different uh, uh, with these Ugandan oil fields uh, working with Tanzania? Absolutely, it's going to be different. There is part of the component is building a refinery in the, in, in the country. That refinery will create an, a, a, a space where in the East African, it's just not just going to serve Uganda, but entire East Africa. Part of the, the petroleum resources would be refined, and distributed in Uganda, Tanzania, and the entire East, East, East African market. Right now, a lot of them are importing refined products out of Saudi Arabia and out of the UAE. But now that's a big market that can be used with regionally. And you, while we on that, just right up north from South Africa, for example, 
we have some of the largest gas deposits in the world besides um, Russia and Qatar in Mozambique. You, our ability to take that gas regionally and make it benefit the Mozambique and, and Tanzania and South Africa and across Africa. And I think that is a new wave that we have to look at with the oil and natural gas sector around Africa. No longer should we be thinking about sending everything to Europe and America and Asia. We should be thinking about domestication because our markets that are growing and growing vastly, they need these resources for us to be able to industrialize and manufacture and create jobs at home. I believe that uh, this is uh, quite a piece of unique infrastructure that's being built. Tell us a little bit about this pipeline. This pipeline, as unique as it is, you, you've seen, first of all, $3.5 billion during COVID times in Africa, it is massive. And also, if you look at the collaboration between two states, which is always very difficult for two states to come around to put this. But also one of the key things which, which I, we really place with this pipeline is the ability to have a plan that would go, um, hopefully, without any security issues. So there's a lot of technology that goes in there, but a lot of manpower. The number of people that would go into this would also create would also create an advantage. But bigger than this, South Sudan, which South Africa is already getting very involved in South Sudan and other African countries, might also have a chance to export its petroleum products through that, the same pipeline. And now this would also create new developments of oil and natural gas resources where in the past people have shied away from that region, even the Congo and even parts of Rwanda and, and, and parts of uh, for Uganda for lacking of an outlet to ship out any petroleum resources. Now there is an outlet you can ship out. Now there is plan to build multiple refineries. You can refine. So it's not just a pipeline to get products out, but it's a pipeline that creates a market around the region and spur other developments. We just have to make sure we have policies that meets those developments, but we also have to take it upon us to really meet our own challenge. We cannot just wait for government to do everything for us that we can do for ourselves. That sense of personal responsibility from the business community, we have to match it. We have to match words with deeds and we have to create jobs that meet the needs of our people, especially in the post COVID recovery um, Africa that we're looking at. Talking about the technology, I mean, we're looking at uh, 1,445 kilometers of pipeline, but I guess what is also unique is the fact that uh, these Ugandan uh, reserves require for it to be heated along the way to make sure that it flows. That's quite a, a, quite a thing. It is quite a thing because you've seen some heavy crude and it has to be heated and you would have to flow, but you're looking at also the refineries, for example, some of the refineries in China, they would have to really have the right kind, the, the, the crude can be con contaminated. And you're looking at the various kind of HSE provisions that have been put in place. I'll give you an example, that crude might be able to walk in some of the refineries in South Africa. That's why I keep saying South Africa is one of the countries that can really look at some of the technology there because they already have tried, true, and tested experience with that kind of crude and that kind of environment when you, as compared to the other side of West Africa with the Bernie Sweet light crude out of Nigeria. So you can really import some of the technologies that have been used around the Southern African region to go up there and really capture part of these, these dollars than just rely on saying all the work should come in from China or other, other foreign companies. Nothing wrong with foreign companies working, but be, be, being biased, I want to see African companies developing this because it, it's all beyond us just keeping the dollars in Africa, it's also inspirational 
to know that 60 to 80% of the workers are going to be Africans and it's built in Africa, made in Africa. But this is going to be one of the top technology driven pipelines because you have some of the newest technology that is going to be used on. And this is something where the next project that looks something similar like this is being done in Russia. But that is in a place where you have the, um, temperatures of minus 50 degrees in Africa is the opposite. And so we're going to see some really top technology here. And for our young people, this is a great chance to really see something different that could kind of spur around the continent. So what's the real cost of this project? Because environmentalists are saying that, hang on, this is going to threaten uh, some ecologically sensitive areas along this route. And uh, that might be a cost that's too much to bear. I, I, we, we have to pay so much concern to the environment. I think anybody who doesn't pay concern to the environment, first of all, you're not African because we're very close to our nature. We're very close to what we, we, we need to be good stewards and live our environment better than we met it. When you look at the sensitivities that have been put in place, you are saying that one, the, you, will not, you are unlikely to have cost overruns. Two, the environments are going to be protected. Various measures have been taken by both countries. But also, you're also going to have to deal with the fact, with the, with the fact that you would have to deal with community issues. What gives me more, a, a lot of pleasure in this is provisions to handle community issues from displacement of communities, hiring communities, ensuring that communities would be part of the projects all throughout the 1,400 kilometers. Because if you don't have the communities involved, then you would face problems like what you face in Nigeria with um, the, in the Niger Delta region with vandalism, pipeline explosions, and, thus, and, and things like that that we don't want to see happening with Tanzania and Uganda. It is not acceptable. But also the environment is a very sensitive thing. The um, environmental commissions of both countries have set up a bunch of monitoring and evaluations that would go out throughout the process. We must encourage them to keep those checks and balances, but also invite civil society as part of the process. You cannot ignore civil society. Bring civil society in, work with them, because they might have ideas that could be helpful to ensure that we are not building something that ends up destroying the environment, because at the end, it becomes a loss to everybody, it becomes a loss to the farmlands around the region, around the areas, and those who still want to keep agriculture as a, as, as a stalemate for their communities. So what I do believe and what we've pushed for as a chamber is that bring civil society in, work on this monitoring and evalu evaluation commissions with them, go with all ideas, and no issues are taboo so that everybody can win on this. Let's talk about the route. If I draw a straight line, it seems that it might have been shorter to go through Kenya. Why was Tanzania uh, chosen as the partner for Uganda? I think when you look at it, it might have been shorter to go through Kenya, but I think you would have to also admit that regional politics have a role to play in it. When you look at where Kenya was already trying to get something around Mombasa, which Uganda was not likely, likely going to be happy with that. But bigger than that also, I think Uganda was also trying to tap into the vast oil discoveries around Tanzania. And so you're going to see a lot more of oil discoveries that can fit in into that same pipeline and which you have more discoveries in, Tanz in the Tanzanian side than on the Kenyan side. Gas discoveries on the Tanzanian side 87 TCF of gas, almost going to be in top 10 around the world in Tanzania. But on a refined product side, Tanzania, the population in Tanzania is almost 85 million persons. You're going to see a big need for refined products and refined product shortage has always been an acute problem in, in Tanzania. So the economics as well was also part of the process that, that, that really drives it. 
But I think that is that in, in, in itself has been, there has been some kind of resolutions where the refinery, they are going to cut out tariffs on shipping and circulating refined products in the area, which those, th so that would allow for products to move into Kenya, move into the region without tariffs, which I think is a step in the right direction. All right, and perhaps as a final question, uh, huge reserves that uh, look like uh, are available for the region, uh, huge investments uh, that uh, these big companies are putting in. But the big question is, is there a future for oil, given where uh, the international community is going in terms of electrifying cars and looking for cleaner fuels? There is a future for oil because oil is going to be around for at least the next 50 to 60 years. But also, we must admit the energy transition is here and we, the train has left the station. We have to be part of that train. And when you look at what is going on around the world, we should not hold back as Africans and not jump on this. We should embrace oil. We should, bet we should use that oil to be able to finance our own transition. What if we, what if we take out 40% of the revenues coming out of oil rather than spend it on buying some nice, fancy um, Louis Vuitton and Gucci? We use that 40% to drive up entrepreneurship and finance local entrepreneurs to look at other sources of energy that could drive our communities and improve it. Let's not forget 650 million Africans still don't have access to any kind of power. And the other 300 that have some kind of access, they are stuck with load shedding or other things and public utility companies are not doing well. So that gives you a greater opportunity to be able to provide energy access. That is the rallying call of the day. So the oil and gas industry still has a role to play, but we need to look at the past and say we cannot repeat those mistakes because the window is tight. But then there, when you look at gas, it's a bridge fuel is rather to, from coal and oil and moving gas to be able to say we can monetize gas, it's cleaner, it's better, and monetize gas to move into renewables. What do you do with that? You build an agricultural base with urea, ammonia, NPK plants, fertilizer plants that will still build um, agricultural base, industrialize Africa. Yes, we could have arguments about energy transition and climate change, but that's, um, but that's irrelevant because we already see where the Western world is going, where they're putting money. There's a lot of blockage on oil um, production and coal production. This, this, they're cutting out financing for that for, for, for the industry. And for African countries, you go fast, go move quickly. For example, South Africa has gas discoveries. Stop waiting around thinking that if you delay this for 10 years, you are going to still reap the benefits. No, do the deal today, cut a deal, let them develop that, benefit from it before they turn off the tab on you.